Today is Tuesday, January 19th, and this is a post-market review for the stock market activities today. Right before the week started, on my weekend video, we talked about an anticipation of a pullback in yields, and that in turn will help big tech and growth stock this week. And so far, from the first day of trading of the week, you saw an ad performance from the Nasdaq and tech names today. We also saw a pullback in the US dollar and that lifted sectors such as energy, materials, and industrials. Meanwhile, the pullback in yields, while in turn helping technology names rising higher, it added pressure on the financial sector. Even though we saw decent earnings in the morning from Goldman Sachs and Bank of America, we also heard from the upcoming Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, a.k.a. the Godmother, and she made several important statements regarding the U.S. dollar, regarding the upcoming stimulus bill and cryptocurrencies. So that moved the market and you saw Bitcoin closing at the lows of the session today. Furthermore, after the bell, we heard from Netflix reporting earnings. And last time I checked, the stock is rallying about 12% after hours. And if you watched yesterday's video the earnings week preview we talked about netflix earnings in details and the fact that this company is shifting from a growth company into a maturing company and so far from the announcement after the bill netflix is anticipating that it will be cash flow neutral by the end of the year for the first time ever and they will use their cash flow to buy back shares a very typical behavior of a maturing company. We talked about the subscriber ceiling for Netflix. And while the company continues to grow in that aspect, there is a limit to how many subscribers they're going to reach. We're not going to have Martians subscribing for Netflix after the entire population of planet Earth already subscribed. So they will have to resort to different strategies, mainly hiking prices. But the more subscribers you're going to have, the more demand for content. And that would pressure margins because you're going to have to produce more content. The Indian subscriber is looking for Indian content. The Arab subscriber is looking for Arab content. The German subscriber is looking for German content. While we have international content that is appealing to pretty much everybody such as the Queen Gambit, Netflix will have to go into a production spree to satisfy all the hunger worldwide for different content. Add to that the pressure from the streaming wars from different applications like Disney Plus, HBO Max, etc. And the take here is Netflix is pretty much was made possible via the Federal Reserve. It is the same story as Amazon. Amazon has been operating with no profits. It's a company that has been losing money year after year after year, but somehow it managed to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. Why is that? It's due to the quantitative easing policy for the Federal Reserve. Amazon is capable of securing loans at 0% rate, using that money to expand larger and larger, and or pricing competitors in small business and thus destroying them. And then after years of these practices, Amazon has finally become profitable on the expense of small business. If you are a small business owner, you don't have access to free loans and you cannot afford to operate year after year being not profitable. This is the same story with Netflix. It hasn't been profitable for years and years and years. It is pretty much a company that is using debt at very low interest rates to expand. And in that course, they have destroyed a lot of Hollywood studios. If you are a studio operator, you have to raise the money. For the project, you have to raise an advertising budget. You're not going to have access to interest-free loans. You have to be thoroughly vetted before you get any loan. And then you have to pay distributors to release your content in the box office and take the risk whether it's going to be a hit or flop. Meanwhile, Netflix doesn't have to do anything. They get cash interest-free. They produce the content. They release it on their platform directly, whether it's a hit or a miss, who cares, as long as the platform continues to expand, produce more content. So these businesses, Amazon, Netflix, they were only made possible due to the Federal Reserve's policies. The Netflix earnings call is happening right now as I'm recording this video. 
so I don't have any access to it and I cannot predict how the stock will react to whatever information we hear during the conference call. But it has been a pattern for Netflix stock to give up the gains after hours right after they report their earnings in the very next day. So I will be fading the move tomorrow, not necessarily shorting the stock. But if I own Netflix or if I played this move via call options, I will be taking profits first thing in the morning tomorrow anyhow this is how the day unfolded and we will talk a lot more about these subjects during the headlines of the day segment but for now we do have a market to cover and here we go the dow industrial average closing in the green by 116.26 points or a gain of 0.38 percent the nasdaq the outperformer of the day closing in the green by 198.68 points or a gain of 1.53%. The S&P 500 also closing in the green by 30.66 points or a gain of 0.81%. Moving on to the sector's performances for the day, leading the pack and capturing the gold medal, communication services, thanks to the ad performance from Google and Facebook. At number two, capturing the silver medal, energy. At number three for the bronze, technology. Meanwhile, the laggards of the day, led by utilities, consumer defensives, and real estate. Moving on to the futures market performance for the day. And right away, we see a decline in the US dollar that is helping crude oil rising higher. The WTI closing a little over 1% for the day. Meanwhile, the Brent closing a little over 2%. And likewise, we saw a rally in metals, gold, silver, platinum, copper, all participating in the upside. Meanwhile, palladium is the only underperformer here in metals. The chip shortage in the automotive industry is adding pressure on palladium because a lot of companies have stopped the production lines for now until they have access to more chips. That is also adding pressure on palladium because the demand for catalytic converters will go down as the assembly and the production lines for the automotive industries being shut down. What about softs? We saw declines for OJ, coffee, and sugar. Meanwhile, an upside day for lumber, cotton, and the biggest winner of the day, coca, closing almost 3% today. What about meats? Massive gains for live cattle, up over 5%. Meanwhile, modest gains for feeder cattle. But on the other hand, lean hogs closing the session in the red. What about grains? After a massive rally, we see some declines here for soybean products, corn, oats, and canola. The only shining light in grains futures today was rough rice. And we do have news about the hoarding from China regarding grains, specifically corn. They've been hoarding a lot of commodities, whether you're talking about copper, soybeans, corn, even lean hogs, and all of that is acting as tailwind for the prices of these futures, adding more inflationary pressure on the economy. Moving on to the big casino, the options market. Let's see how the tables did today. You're seeing the first formation of the upcoming steamy rally. Whether that's going to take place or not, it doesn't matter. But there are traders who are already taking positions, anticipating an upcoming steamy rally due to the new brown of the 400 bucks stimulus. They have witnessed how hot these stocks got with a mere 600 stimulus. So the thinking now is that we're going to have an even bigger rally due to the 1400 bucks stimulus. Whether that's going to happen or not, that is up for grabs. There are a lot of factors here that will determine where the market is going to go, mainly the inauguration tomorrow and all the executive orders that will take place from the upcoming Biden's administration. So be careful about your assumptions here. And what are the traders buying in anticipation of the new STEMI rally? The STEMI names Tesla, Palantir, NEO, Plug Power, Blink Charging, the usual. And you see that the hottest table for the day was Tesla with a little over 1.1 million contracts. About 54% of those were calls. Coming up, number two, Apple with a little over 1 million contracts about 73 percent of those were calls and here it is a number three we talked about this name during the weekend update video and i told you that i'm anticipating a repeat of the performance of gamestop in amc and the reason is they've already been pumping on reddit and tiktok etc they've already positioned themselves ahead of time they bought the call options and then they started pumping on reddit tiktok youtube 
noticed a lot of YouTubers all of a sudden pumping AMC stock as this is the future bro. Not really, but all of what they're doing is they're following what happened in GameStop stock. They already saw the pump on Reddit. All of a sudden they're coming out with videos recommending AMC buying options the AMC and now they're sounding like a bunch of geniuses oh I called the rally the AMC that is all bullshit you know it and I know it the pump was bound to happen everybody pretty much anticipated this pump they're looking for any name with a high short float and they're trying to orchestrate a short covering rally via an organized effort and you see that AMC traded about 590,000 contracts that is a massive volume for a small stock and about 79% of those were calls and notice this they're not buying the stock they're buying call options even though the stock is trading at about three bucks and some of these call options actually cost more than the entire value of the stock which is pretty comical but it shows you that all of what they're interested in is a pump and dump. They buy these outlandish call options way out of the money. They pump on their platforms. And when you see a move like this happening, AMC up almost over 30%. They let it ride for a little while as the gamma squeeze continue to happen. And then they dump on the heads of the late entrance to the trade. And this is, of course, another illustration to this uh, jungle market that we're living in. No rules, no regulations, no watchdog whatsoever. Or otherwise, what Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell would call, quote-unquote, market functioning. And before we leave the options market, let's check on the unusual activities that took place today. Here is the first one for the ticker XP and this is a Brazilian fintech company and they are making a wild bet here buying the 34 puts expiration date February 19th with expectation that this name will decline over 21 and a half percent by then and they are paying about 20 cents a piece to enter the trade and we saw significant uptick in volume for this name very very unusual kind of trade and what about the ticker SKX, this is for Skechers, the shoes company, my favorite. I do have the widest feet ever, sort of like a caveman feet. And the only company that makes shoes wide enough is Skechers. And in this case, traders are making a bullish bet for the name, buying the 43 calls expiration date February 19th, with expectation that the name would rally over 19% by then. And they are paying about 80 cents a piece to enter this trade, bringing the total well above one million dollars here's another one for the ticker mrvl marvel technologies and this is one of the best semiconductor names we talked about this name specifically the chart of marvel and we're looking for a breakout out of the consolidation channel furthermore due to the chips shortage in the automotive industry and marvel is one of the biggest providers in that particular industry you're gonna see an increase in prices high demand these are all tailwinds to lift marvel higher add to that the fact that the stock is not outlandishly overvalued when you compare it to names such as amd nvidia etc and in this case they're making a massive upside bet for marvel buying the 60 calls expiration date march 19th with expectation that the name would rally over 11 and percent by then and they are paying about two bucks and 15 cents to enter the trade bringing the total to almost two million dollars and what about this trade for intel the ticker intc intel is reporting earnings on thursday and here is somebody bidding for an upside call here buying the 62 and a half calls expiration date january 29th with the expectations that intel would rally over eight percent by then and they are paying about 70 cents to enter the trade bringing the total well above half a million dollars now this could be an Intel shareholder and all what they're doing is they're taking advantage of the surge in volatility lifting the premium prices for options and they're selling an upside call to raise some cash exactly the same strategy I outlaid in my earnings preview video and here's a very interesting trade for Lockheed Martin the ticker LMT this is a name that has been underperforming significantly since the Biden election last year due to the market's expectation that the Biden administration will cut defense spending and you saw defense names whether it is Lockheed Martin or Northrop Grumman or even Raytheon declining significantly since the Biden's election however there is new you hope for these names specifically Lockheed Martin we have uh, Tesla witch Kathy Woods making a new ETF for space stocks 
in one of those stocks is Lockheed Martin. If the arc mania continues and you see retail traders piling their money buying Kathy Wood's new space ETF, that would also be a positive factor for Lockheed Martin. The name would rally regardless due to the ETF effect. And in this case, they're buying the 370 calls expiration date, March 19, with expectation that the name would rally over 8% by then. And they are paying about four bucks and 20 cents to enter the trade, bringing the total to over four million bucks. And here's a very interesting one for Netflix, the ticker NFLX, in case you didn't know. And they are buying, or they already bought, the 555 calls expiration date January 29th with expectation that Netflix would rise over 10.5% by then and they paid about 420 bucks per contract or 4 bucks and 20 cents a piece to enter this trade bringing the total well above 4 million dollars and what do we see after hours Netflix rallying over 12 so this trade, the trader got it spot on. They risked $4 million, making a bet to the upside. And these options are probably going to double in value tomorrow morning. My bet is that this trader will take their profits first thing in the morning, assuming that Netflix will keep the after hours gains in tomorrow morning's session. So whoever this trader is, salute. You got it right. What about this trade? for data dog the ticker d dog and in this case they're buying the 120 calls expiration date february 12th with expectation that the name would rally over 21 percent by then and they are paying big bucks for this trade about a buck 50 to enter this trade bringing the total to about one and a half million dollars and here is the last trade of the day right at the bottom of the table for the ticker lly eli lily and in this case they're making a bullish bet that eli lily would rally over 11% by the expiration date of March 19th because they're buying the 220 calls and they are paying about 4 bucks and 20 cents to enter this trade, bringing the total well above $2 million. And now, moving on to the headlines that shape the day, starting with some macro news and an update on inflation. We've been talking about the trajectory for inflation being upward and the inflationary pressure on the economy and the stock market. And here we have new information regarding shipping costs, specifically from China, Shanghai, to the port of LA and the Netherlands. And you see that shipping costs have risen dramatically. And that would add more inflationary pressure this time around via supply push kind of inflation because all of these goods being shipped from China will have to be sold to the consumer, to the end consumer that is, at higher prices so if you thought inflation is not coming think again they're about to choke the poor and the middle class to death and here is from morgan stanley mike wilson we talked about this guy numerous times in the past and he had an interview today on cnbc and he said very interesting stuff when the cnbc anchor asked mike wilson if inflation rises and we see the 10 years treasury yield rising as a result that would add a lot of pressure on the stock market specifically growth stocks and the point the anchor was making is the federal reserve will have to implement yield curve control at some point and mike wilson responded no i don't think so because isn't this what jerome powell and the federal reserve wanted all along didn't they ask for more inflation well the result of more inflation is a rise in treasury yields it's all good for growth and it's, and it's good for inflation but it also means rates could move up in a non-linear fashion mm, i mean you have to assume the fed would get involved even more at that point right well, why? I mean, let's, let's, let's just talk about that for a second. The Fed's goals are to get inflation back to, or, I'm sorry, unemployment back to where it was. That's their primary goal. Let's get a full recovery. And if rates start going up because, in fact, the economy is improving faster than maybe anybody expected three or four months ago. And don't forget, the Fed put their, you know, laid their plans out three or four months ago when we didn't have vaccines and we didn't know the outcome of the election. And there was a lot of grandstanding in Congress. Well, that's not going to be the case anymore. So they have to adjust their thought process, right? They do have to have some, you know, sort of two-way risk in the market at some point. Mm. And letting back-end rates go up because growth is better, how does that kill the economy? I don't think it will. But the Federal Reserve is a very confused organization, and Jerome Powell has no clue what he's doing. He wants his cake, and he wants to eat it, too. 
He wants inflation to rise, but magically he doesn't want treasury yields to rise as well because that will hammer the stock market. And Jerome is very confident that he has the tools to control any unwanted surge in treasury yields. And it appears that market participants are putting all of their trust in Jerome Powell and they continue to gamble in the stock market, taking more in more risk. But here is Mike Wilson regarding inflation. Biden's 1.9 trillion stimulus proposal combined with the 900 billion bill passed last month quote unquote amounts to roughly 15% of GDP. That is a lot of money chasing fewer goods and services that aren't even available yet. What does that mean? It means demand pull inflation. And the question is, can suppliers keep up with the demand and increase their production to meet the surge in demand? Well, you already have a clue. We're closing factories due to COVID surges, and we already have a shortage in chips. So the supply is already struggling to meet the current demand. What do you think going to happen when we see a surge of demand? You will have to see a significant uptick in industrial production, manufacturing activities to meet that demand. So for all of these inflation skeptics out there, we're going to see a shock of inflation happening in the economy very soon, and that will cause a market crash. Whether that will be remedied by a surge in supply to muff the massive spike in inflation, that is still up for grabs. But the picture we have right now is that inflation will rise significantly higher. And by the way, here is a chart for the money supply. And as you can see, the last year's surge in US money supply was the largest in 150 years. And the point of this chart is to show you that every time we see a surge of money supply, inflation has a lagging reaction, but it eventually rises to meet the rise in money supply. So we have the largest increase of money supply pretty much in history since 150 years ago and the trajectory here that inflation will follow through and rise higher furthermore and this is probably the ticking bomb not just in the united states but in the global economy as a whole the debt share of gdp is forecasted to reach about 200 percent by the 2040s and for now the cost to service this debt is pretty much very minimal however if we see a rise of inflation, and we see a rise in interest rates, what will happen to the future of the world economy when it is drowning in debt and the cost of servicing this debt surges higher? And that leads us to the upcoming Treasury Secretary, the godmother Janet Yellen. And here it is. Janet Yellen will lay out the case for Joe Biden's proposed $1.9 trillion relief package as her confirmation hearing as Treasury Secretary. Janet Yellen went further, saying that the Biden administration should go even bigger, bigger than $1.9 trillion. Why? Because interest rates are still low. So Janet Yellen is arguing for going even bigger, perhaps $2.5 trillion, even $3 trillion, as the new stimulus to take advantage of the current low interest rates. And when Janet Yellen was asked about the end game here, what is the tipping point of this tsunami of debt, printing money out of thin air, and racking more national debt on top of the already stunning amount that we have? But I just want to know what you think, because I know in the past you've expressed concerns about the debt and the deficit. Uh, the two previous administrations have not been very interested in entitlement reform. We have not only the debt that we're adding in the short term because of the pandemic, but we have structural problems that, that are long term that are going to drive that, uh, continue to drive that debt higher in the future. Uh, what your thoughts are with respect to uh, reforming entitlements, with respect to uh, the amount of the debt situation that we find ourselves right in, uh, in right now, and, and when is it enough? When is it too much? When do we hit that point where... Um, the thing starts to collapse. Uh, that's what really concerns me. And nobody is talking about it uh, really in either party anymore. It was something that used to occupy a lot of our discussions in the past, but nobody seems to care much about it. And uh, for me, that is a, a huge um, warning sign uh, on the horizon. The fact that we have an ever-growing deficit, an ever-growing debt, and, um, and no apparent interest in taking the steps that are necessary to address it. Senator, I agree with you that it's essential that we um, put the um, federal budget uh, on a path that's sustainable. 
and that we're responsible and make sure that what we do with respect to deficits and debt leave future generations better off. But the most important thing in my view that we can do today to put us on a path of fiscal sustainability is to defeat the pandemic. So according to Janet Yellen, this is not the time to think about the national debt. We need to crush COVID, according to her. I did not know that throwing more money at COVID would crush it. I guess uh, debt is the new vaccine. But let's move on to market sentiment news. And here it is. Even market participants and traders are starting to get the message that the inflationary trade is about to happen. And here it is. Traders are pricing in the highest inflation rate over the next five years since 2018. Furthermore, they continue to bet against the US dollar. And here it is. Speculative investors have amassed more than $10 billion of bets against the US dollar, the most since March 2018. So some corners of market participants are seeing the big picture. High inflation, lower US dollar. Yet they're taking a lot of risk here, making excessive bets against the US dollar. And that could be a recipe for disaster. If we have an event that would trigger a short covering rally in the US dollar, that is the risk that you have to keep in mind. When everybody's placing their bets in one direction, we have consensus the US dollar is going to go down. That is the long term trajectory. So let's go ahead and go all in betting against the US dollar. That could be a recipe for disaster, regardless whether their projection of where the US dollar is heading is right or wrong, because there is a mechanical aspect to the market as well. When you have outlandish bets in a certain direction, in this case, shorting the US dollar, things could go wrong. Take a look at what happened to GameStop stock. And again, we're comparing two different things, but that is a stock that was heavily shorted. And all it took is a couple of retail traders pumping on Reddit to trigger one of the most epic short covering rallies we have seen so far. More in market sentiment news. Here it is. No profits, no problem. Basket of unprofitable tech companies has gone parabolic in past year. And the moral of the story is that the majority of retail participation in the market is still not getting the memo regarding inflation and the trajectory of the US dollar, which will make these unprofitable tech companies, growth companies, very unattractive. And you will see these stocks crashing down significantly. But the new entrants of the market, these are the Robin Hood crowd and the likes. They have no experience in macroeconomics or anything like that. All they know is you put your blindfold on, you continue to buy call options out of the money and any dips are worthy of buying. Just put your blindfold on and buy, 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 and don't ask questions. And what are they buying? The most speculative names, penny stocks, companies with no profits, companies with no revenue, tech names, growth names. And it is no wonder that certain traders are reading the psychology and they're placing their bets already, buying call options in Tesla, Plug Power, etc. in anticipation of the new stimulus. The new stimulus will go where? It will go to these trades, the retail favor, the growthy names, no profits, no revenue, etc. Will that work? Who knows? But the landscape in investing is changing as we speak, so long as inflation rises and the US dollar slides lower. Sectors in the market that were attractive before, now they become unattractive. Sectors that were unattractive in the growth era, they become attractive in the value era. And here it is more in market sentiment. What level of risk do you think you're currently taking in your investment? And market participants are saying the highest ever. We're taking more risk than ever. Buying penny stocks, added the money call options, companies with no profits. Who cares? Profits are for losers, bro. Is this a recipe for disaster or what? But they are taking these outlandish levels of risk due to the Federal Reserve backing. They think that the Federal Reserve will protect the market from any downfall. That is wrong. And you're already seeing the 10 years treasury yield climbing higher, not lower. That is an environment to punish 
risky behavior in investing. Are these market participants getting the memo or not? The likelihood is they're not because they're very indulged in this bubble. And here is a BlackRock CEO saying that a leading investor is flagging worries about valuations and inflation. And I know what the Robin Hood is going to say. Who is this guy? What does he know? Geniuses. This is the guy that you're buying your ETFs from. You think he doesn't know what's going on? Think again. But I know you're all market geniuses right now. You figured out how to trade stocks and how to invest. You're the new Warren Buffett. Nothing is going to go wrong whatsoever. Watch. Fink, speaking on a webinar presented the Fund Manager 2021 Outlook, said he had a conversation with, quote unquote, one of the largest investors in Asia, which he did not identify. They are worried about some of the equity valuations right now. But they are also somewhat concerned about the impact of rising inflation, said Fink, who leads the world's largest asset manager, BlackRock, with $8.7 trillion in assets under management. Here it is. Should interest rates go higher before they jump back into fixed income? Question mark. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell last week said it is way too early to talk about making any changes to the central bank's easy monetary policy stance, including its $120 billion a month bond buying program. There is plenty of slack in the labor market and it is unlikely that wages pressures are going to be reaching a level that would create and support higher inflation, the Fed chair said. Now, please pay attention here. Jerome Powell wants inflation, but at the same time, he's worried about the rising inflation impact on stocks. Jerome Powell is a very confused person. He has no clue what he's doing. He wants his cake and he wants to eat it too. Ask yourself a question. Are commodities prices rising or not? Take a look at the chart of corn, soybeans, copper, any commodity you want. Go to the grocery store, check out the prices, go to the gas station. You're paying now more than any time during the pandemic, meaning that oil prices are rising. Furthermore, shipping costs are rising, as I showed you in the beginning of this segment. And the question is, if inflation is rising, shouldn't the Federal Reserve raise interest rates instead of not thinking about thinking about thinking about raising interest rates? But here it is. The Federal Reserve cares less about food prices, gasoline prices, commodities prices. They don't care about that. To them, we are still in a low inflation environment and we need inflation to rise higher. What is the single thing that the Federal Reserve looks at when they decide to raise interest rates to so-called curb inflation? Say it with me. Wages. God forbid your wages go higher. And Jerome Powell has to end the party and raise interest rates. And in this case, the BlackRock CEO is saying, yeah, we could have inflation, but wages are going to remain low. So the Federal Reserve is not going to touch interest rates. Here is the problem. The Biden administration is already raising the federal minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour. That is number one. Number two. What did we learn from this whole work at home environment during the pandemic? That employees have more choices now. They can work at any location they want. They can work from Zoom. They're not restricted to any geographic location, meaning that there will be more competition for talent. That will add upper pressure on wages. You have to pay top talent more to work for you because now they have more choices. They can work in New York, they can work in San Francisco, they can work in Ohio via Zoom while staying at home. And I know what you're going to say, but doesn't that work both ways where employers now have access to a bigger pool of employees? You're generally right, but they always had an access to a bigger pool of employees. People apply for the job and if they get it, they move to the location where the company is located. The change in the game here is, as a top talent employee, we're talking about white collar wages in the technology sector, etc. There is more competition on your talent this time around, and you can demand higher wages. What does that mean? That higher wages are coming, not for all of us, but it will be enough to trigger an inflationary pressure in terms of wages. So all of the skeptics who say, yeah, the inflation around you doesn't matter because the Federal Reserve only cares about wages and they're not going to raise interest rates because wages are never going to go higher. You're wrong. The minimum wage is going higher and we have more competition 
on top talent which will take wages higher. Continuing with the article. Right now, the bond market is starting to say we're going to start seeing rising inflation. We are going to have more robust economy in 6 to 12 months said Fink. And if the forward curve of the bond market is correct, one could expect in 9 or 12 months at the very least the Federal Reserve and other central banks starting to re-evaluate their monetary policy. Are you paying attention or not? You're probably not because you're indulged in this bubble. Neo this, plug power that. It's a casino for you. It's not a market. It's not an investment vehicle. It's a game. But for us rational investors, we're paying attention to what's going on. Jerome can deny all he wants, but inflation will speak the loudest. Remember that. Continuing. As for valuations, Fink said there are parts of the equity markets that are probably mispriced with quote-unquote ridiculous price to earnings ratios these are just giant momentum trades we see this time and time again this is not me saying this this is not some perma bear saying this this is the guy you're buying you etfs from the black rock ceo himself saying that we are seeing ridiculous valuations in the stock market and these are just momentum trades meaning if you buy them now as an investment you're a fool and you're going to lose your money 100%. And this whole argument that PE ratios don't matter anymore, this is your boy Jerome Powell saying that, and he's saying that you could justify the ridiculous PE ratios in the market because the risk-free rate is low. Well, the risk-free rate is rising higher as Jerome Powell is speaking, with no stop in sign. And when they try to do yield curve control, questions are going to be asked. Why are you doing yield curve control? Isn't this what you wanted all along, Jerome Powell? Higher inflation? Moving on to corporate-specific news. And we heard some results in the morning from Goldman Sachs. And I told you this is going to be a monster report. And here it is. Goldman Sachs crushes analysts' estimates on stronger-than-expected stock trading investment banking. Goldman Sachs reported earnings per share of 12.08 bucks versus the 7.47 per share expected by analysts. Monster beat. And here it is. This is a stunning number. Revenue of 11.74 billion was about 1.75 billion more than the analysts' estimates. And for all the Robin Hoodiets who keep saying, oh, we're beating Wall Street, bro. We have total control of the market right now. Guess what, genius? This is where your money is going. Goldman Sachs. When you buy call options and they expire worthless, where do you think the money is going? Goldman Sachs. The Robin Hoodiets are the best thing that ever happened to Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, BlackRock, all of these massive financial investment companies. And by the way, let's comment on this piece from CNN. President-elect Joe Biden has announced he is tapping Gary Gensler to lead the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC. It is a win for Elizabeth Warren and progressives. Really? This is who Elizabeth Warren wanted to lead the SEC? This is the guy who's supposed to be the tough cop? On Wall Street, give me a break. This is a Goldman Sachs alumni. You think he's going to police his own school? Think again. And here we have more news for the EV wars, specifically from Tesla. Did you know that Tesla is a Chinese company now? When you buy your Tesla, you're buying a Chinese car. Because here it is. The Model Y is the second vehicle Tesla has made and sold in China after the Model 3. And in case you buy this uh, cheap Chinese car that is overpriced and then you discover that the bolts that are holding the roof are cheap Chinese made bolts. Or if you're uh, driving in the middle of the highway and your suspension system fails, don't go on Twitter and at Elon Musk and complain to the Rev about the shitty product that you just bought. Because here it is. Tesla is hiring customer support specialists to address social media escalations aimed at Elon Musk. There are a lot of customers for Tesla who every time they have a complaint, they go on Twitter and they write their complaints addressed to Elon Musk. And sometimes he goes through and he answers and addresses those complaints. As we know, the rev is very cheap and he doesn't want to hire a customer service department. So he would rather answer customers' complaints himself. But this is becoming very, very overwhelming right now, considering the fact that a lot of Teslas are being recalled and a lot of customers are discovering that these are cheap Chinese-made cars. So Tesla is hiring a customer service department to answer 
and address all of your complaints. Moving on to General Motors, and here it is, the news that triggered a massive move in GM stock today. In the Wall Street Journal, Microsoft bit bigger on driverless car space with investment in GM's crews. The tech giant will host cloud services for GM's autonomous vehicle subsidiary. Financing brings Cruise's valuation to 30 billion dollars meaning that the upside for general motors here is way way higher than where the stock is trading right now because if they can reward tesla for the garbage they're making why not reward a company that is actually producing more cars than tesla and is hitting to be a very large competitor in the ev wars not only that they're beating tesla's objectives of releasing robot taxes so if you keep saying that oh tesla is an 800 billion dollars company but it is justified it's okay because of the robot taxes bro well the robot taxes are coming not from Tesla, but from GM instead. And by the way, who is the genius analyst who told you that GM will become a momentum name way ahead of the time? Matter of fact, last summer, was it a Goldman Sachs analyst? Was it a genius on CNBC? No, it was not. It was yours truly in this channel. We talked about General Motors becoming the next momentum play back during last summer when the name was hated nobody wanted to buy it which takes me to ford and we have some news here for ford motor ford has ordered a month-long production hold at one of its plants in germany the latest sign that a global shortage of computer chips is putting car makers under increasing pressure and threatening the recovery from the pandemic let's stop for a second here and talk about which semiconductor names will benefit from this shortage number one taiwan semi because they will manufacture those chips regardless number two marvell their chips go to automakers more than a lot of other chips makers and number three any chips manufacturing equipment makers such as applied materials lamb research asml those are the names that are going to benefit from the shortage in chips in the automotive industry but that takes me to ford and i don't understand the management of ford right now you're seeing a market mania happening at every hint of an ev future hydrogen fuel cells batteries any garbage even if it is just empty promises gm announces flying vehicles you think gm is going to produce flying vehicles anytime soon forget about it but that is enough in this market bubble to trigger dumb money from retail traders to chase the name so why aren't ford releasing more even if it is fake news just release some information about your upcoming ev vehicles oh ford's gonna produce ev helicopters ford's gonna produce ev boats whatever it is just throw something out there and ford stock will double in value they have the mustang mash e or mac e whatever it is maybe mcdonald's should produce an EV calling it the Mac E and you'll see McDonald's stock surging way higher. McDonald's is the future, bro. But back to Ford. For the love of God, the management of Ford, if you're listening to this, announce something, anything, even if it's fake, who cares? In this market bubble, you will double the stock value if you announce anything regarding upcoming EV projects. The Mustang alone is not enough. You need something more than that. COVID, 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 COVID. And moving on to COVID news. Did you know that COVID is making a comeback in China? Here it is. China's COVID outbreak worst since 2020 or March 2020 rather. This is from Reuters and this is supposed to be the country that is controlling COVID the best and vaccinated a huge portion of their population why are they having an outbreak right now can somebody provide us with answers maybe Fauci is going to be able to speak a little more now that the Biden administration is taking over we need some answers here because we are in the dark and when I say in the dark here it is remember that Israel is supposed to be the leading country in the world in terms of vaccinating their population supposedly they have already vaccinated 20% or more of their population. But here it is. Israeli COVID czar says first Pfizer jab not as effective as hope and blames spike in cases on the British strain. So once again, is the vaccine protecting us from new strains or not? What is going on here? Can somebody provide some answers for us? 
Where is Dr. Fauci? He needs to come over tomorrow and address these concerns. Because here it is. California health official urges halt to 300,000 Moderna vaccinations after reports of allergic reactions. And remember that Moderna CEO Stefan Bensel last week during the JP Morgan 2021 conference said that the COVID-19 virus will stay with us forever. Wait a minute here, Mr. Bensel. If your vaccine is effective, why would COVID-19 stay with us forever? Could somebody provide some answers here? And of course, and this is a very sad note, we are in a tragedy, an absolute human tragedy, and it seems like nobody cares. This COVID-19 crisis showed us the ugly side of humanity. We don't give a damn about one another. And the number of cases and death is rising in a stunning way. Matter of fact, we have lost almost 400,000 people in this country alone since the pandemic started. And here it is. There's a backlog of bodies in uh, Los Angeles County here in California. And we heard last night that LA suspend air quality rules to cremate backlog of COVID-19 victims. Very tragic and very sad piece of news right here. But it illustrates to you the magnitude of the crisis that we're already in. Moving on to the heat map analysis for the day. Let's see what happened. Number one, we saw retreat in yields. That is good for what? Technology names, momentum names, and it is bad for what? Financials. You're seeing the picture right in front of you. Very clear. We also saw a retreat in the US dollar. That is good for what? Metals, energy, industrials. That is bad for what? Consumer defensives. Very clear pattern today. No mysteries or anything unusual. Take a look at the technology sector. The chips shortage that we just talked about. You see names like Taiwan, Broadcom, AMAD, LAM Research, massive gains for the session, over 5% in certain names. What about big tech? Apple, Amazon muted about half a percentage point to the green. However, the outperformance here came from Google and Facebook. We continue to see an outperformance from Zoom, and it is very interesting the divorce between Zoom's performance versus Peloton. Zoom has been hammered over and over and over again, and now it is rebounding finally, and today we saw about 2.5% gains for Zoom. And the question is, are we anticipating another round of lockdowns once the Biden administration take place? That could be certainly the case, and there are some traders making bullish bets on Zoom. Peloton, on the other hand, been rallying and rallying and rallying while Zoom is declining, and now you're seeing the opposite picture. Zoom goes higher, Peloton lower, matter of fact, Peloton down about 5% today. You're also seeing the pattern of the STEMI trade, the hot IPO names at performing today because they're buying call options ahead of time. Airbnb, DoorDash, all of these hot names riding higher along with video game names, Tesla, Neo, Xpeng, etc. They're taking their positions before the upcoming STEMI rally. But remember this. When everybody is on the same page and they're making the same bet all together, things could go wrong very quickly due to the backstabbing, meaning somebody buying the call options right now, anticipating a steamy rally about two to three weeks from now. But these stocks surge higher and they start taking profits and dumping on the heads of the late entrance to the trade. It's the jungle market once again. Keep that in mind. And when you're looking at the heat map, understand that two charts are dictating the market's trajectory right now. The dollar index and the 10-year treasury yield. The dollar goes down and right away you see massive gains for the usual sectors. Oil, you saw ExxonMobil, Chevron outperforming today. Freeport McMoran, another gain of about 4.5%. But when you see a tick higher in the US dollar, all of a sudden these names start to give up their gains. Likewise, when yields retreat, you see high-tech names, the momentum names rallying higher. And then the next day, when yields start to rally once again, you see the opposite picture, technology going down, finances going up. How long are we going to play this yo-yo game back and forth, back and forth before we have a solid footing. That is going to happen very soon. But for now, we're going back and forth playing the yo-yo game between the inflationary trade versus the deinflationary trade, between the high dollar trade and the low dollar trade until the new administration makes the trajectory very 
very clear. We do have an inauguration happening tomorrow, but for now, we're moving on to the charts analysis and let's see what's going on here with the SPY from a 15 minutes perspective. We saw a gap higher kind of day from the quote unquote mysterious entity pumping overnight. Of course, in accordance with the massive gains we saw in Asian markets and the Australian market. And the difference today is we saw some retail participation picking up the market higher, specifically after the Janet Yellen remarks. But all in all, the S&P 500, the SPY in this case, closed flat. When I say flat, I'm talking about the trading hours. Look at where the SPY opened and where it closed. It's pretty much right at the same spot. We have a very critical day tomorrow. The inauguration, the whole volatility that could happen tomorrow from any executive orders, anything that goes wrong with the security situation, and just the fact that investors will see the face of Joe Biden taking the oath, that is a realization that the new regime of high taxes is coming. So don't be surprised if we see a negative reaction in the market tomorrow. With that being said, let's move on to the daily chart, the continuous contract for the S&P 500. And let me remind you, for what I said about a week ago. By the way, the bullish scenario here is that you're going to go back, check the upper line of the range that you just broke out of, make sure that it is solid support, and then bouncing higher. And this is exactly what is happening right now. We're going back to retest the upper limit of the channel as support. And so far, we bounced higher from it. The question is, are we going to have a confirmation tomorrow? And are we going to close the week above the support line or not that would constitute a success if we close the week above the trend line that would be very bullish for the market closing below the trend line would be a very ominous signal moving on to the queues 15 minutes chart gapping higher you saw a little bit of a sell-off in the morning but as janet yellen started to speak you saw treasury yields declining and declining. That was helpful for the technology sector to catch a bid and you saw a massive rally in tech name throughout the day but we are still trading from a daily perspective underneath the trend line we haven't captured the very steep trend line yet could happen tomorrow if we see another decline in yields but for now we still have a negative divergence in the rsi signaling that the queues remain weak of course we are looking for a change in that negative divergence starting to see more momentum in the queues recapturing the trend line and rallying higher so tomorrow is a very critical day here for the queues. Was today just a one day wonder due to the declines or the retreat? It's not really declines, just a retreat for the 10 year treasury yields. Or is this a sustainable rally that will continue to go for at least days to come? The answer could happen as soon as tomorrow. What about small caps? The IWM, the 15 minutes chart. Another gap higher, yet pretty much trading flat throughout the day. We caught support from where? The upper end of the channel, bouncing higher, via an overnight pump and then trading sideways. What do we see from a daily perspective in the IWM? Nothing has changed yet. We are looking for a break in the RSI. You see the upper trend signaling that the momentum is still very positive. Breaking that trend will signal a turnaround and a shift in momentum. That would be the point where you're going to see the IWM declining all the way down to the level of 191.5 and then we're going to take it from there. What about the dollar index? We talked about the bull flag formation going back and forth, back and forth, trying to crack the resistance level of 90 and a half. We've already done that. And now what? Here is what we see. Is this an ABC formation that will lead us higher in the dollar index? It certainly could be because it is a typical charting behavior. When you crack above a very important resistance level, that you have to go down, recheck it for support, and then bouncing higher. It is the same discussion we had when we talked about the SPY futures. Are we seeing that tomorrow could hold the answer? A failure and closing below 9.5 would tell you that the short covering rally in the Dixie is pretty much coming to an end or at least weakening for the moment. So we're watching how the dollar is going to react tomorrow. A very important day and I expect a lot of volatility for the US dollar, specifically giving the inauguration of the new president. What about gold? Remember we've been talking about the bear flag formation in gold that would lead us down all the way to 1800 that was the message during the weekend video and we saw exactly that gold went almost all the way down to 1800 almost to the penny and then bouncing higher is this sustainable it depends on the trajectory of the u.s dollar tomorrow is a massive day for both gold u.s dollar and the treasury yields speaking of let's visit the tlt first 
Bonds. What do we see here? We have a descending channel. And we said that every time we broke the descending channel to the downside, we managed to recapture the channel and trend back inside it. We did exactly that. And there is room here for the TLT for longer end bonds to rally higher going all the way to the upper end of the channel. That is very possible. And if that happens, treasury yields will go down and that would be a spark to ignite a rally in tech names. Make no mistake here. The trajectory for the TLT is lower. It's going to fail at some point. But for now, we saw a massive surge in yields and it is time to take a break at least for the moment. Moving on to the TNX. What do we see here? We've been talking about an ABC pattern. We had a massive pop to the upside. And the question is how low will the B leg take us? Is it going to be to my projection all the way down to 1% then bouncing higher? Or are the declines we saw the last few days in treasury yields as far as the B leg is going to go? Once again, wait for it. The answer could be as soon as tomorrow. It is going to be an unbelievably important day for many reasons. Not just political, but also from a charting perspective. And lastly, let's conclude with the chart of the VIX. The VIX declining for the session today. However, it is still in the wedge. And it managed to bounce higher before revisiting the lower end of the wedge. That could be interpreted as a bullish signal that we will see a pop higher in the VIX tomorrow. We are looking for a resolution out of the wedge. And remember, the market overall is very bloated. It is extremely hard to find any pockets of value right now. Stay-at-home stocks, reopening stocks, growth stocks, value stocks, energy stocks, financial stocks, they're all trading pretty much at all times high or significantly higher since the bottom. And the question here is, when is the correction? We're waiting and waiting and waiting and anticipating a correction because the market is becoming extremely bloated. Can it go higher and become even more bloated? Sure it can. But next month, February, is historically speaking the worst month for the stock market. We're seeing all the signs and signals for a very overheated market, very primed for a big correction of 10% or more. And the fact that the VIX is consolidating in this wedge and never even bothered to go below 20 tells me that we are going higher before we go lower in the VIX. And let's move on to conclude this video. We do have a very important day tomorrow, the inauguration of the new president, Joe Biden. And when you look at these images of national guard troops all over the place in Washington DC. They're putting roadblocks and barricades all over the place, drones, planes, checkpoints. You would think we are preparing for the aliens invasion, not for a normal process in democracy of exchanging power. But this is what this country have come down to. Who knows what's going to happen tomorrow. But the nation and the market will be on edge. And I expect to see volatility rising. And let's cross our fingers that this will be a peaceful day. No rioting, no interruptions, no violence. But anything could happen and we are all on edge. And the last thing here is, don't forget that we have earnings in the morning tomorrow from Procter & Gamble, United Health, and Morgan Stanley. And then we have United Airlines as well. If you did not watch the earnings preview video, please make sure that you watch it. There are a lot of good information there that I think you will find very helpful. And by the way, I did not forget about your questions. I will answer them starting on tomorrow's video. But for now, that is all I got for you today. I'll talk to you again tomorrow. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe, press the like button, the notification button and follow me on social media.